it's almost spooky how universal alcoholic emotions are. I suppose they're human emotions, but the particular intensity of them that makes them alcoholic emotions are what puzzles everyone. And yet to every one of us, I'm sure if we have, we have few things in common, one thing I'm sure we have in common, no matter how deep it may be buried tonight, somewhere down there the knowledge exists, but my case truly is different. And uh, you may not even notice it, but you wait the next time that you're cross or upset or someone hurts your feelings or someone does something at the meeting that you're cross with and you hear it come back. And that's an almost something that cannot be uh, ever gotten away with. And I'm, in my opinion, that's what causes alcoholics to die, that feeling of difference. Because with that feeling of difference, you cannot take the actions that will save your life or you will discontinue taking them. So the point is, if we always got it, and those actions kill you, why aren't we all dead? And of course, it would seem quite obvious that the reason is, the feelings of difference will kill you unless you treat them and keep them at a low level. Left to their own devices for people like you and me, they become obsessions. And then there's no way in, because that door only opens from the inside. But that's why we gather, to those who are new here tonight, we gather these things, it is really to learn a lot of facts. I mean, we can't learn facts. We meet people and there's a certain amount of sociability. But primarily, the actions of Alcoholics Anonymous over the homogeneity of it is primarily to help you and me continue to remember that we are not so different and to take actions that will keep those feelings of difference at a low level, at least a non-lethal level. There's a lot of talk today about how AA should change and how AA should incorporate so many things and how AA should be of not just so isolated and so rifle-like it should be of help all sorts of people. And people don't realize that that has been tried before. Uh, I don't want to get off into a long harangue about this. I don't know why it popped my mind, but it's your life may depend on My life depends on it, so it's worth a couple minutes. You know, in all the treatment of alcoholism, there's been alcoholic treatments for 4,000 years, over 4,000 years in written history. They didn't always call it alcoholism. They thought sometimes people were invested by the devils and they would put them to death and get rid of them and send them away and all sorts of, and lock them up and put them in insane asylums. But there have always been recorded histories of people who have an unnatural reaction to alcohol. And they've always tried to work on it. They've prayed over them, and they've doctored them, and they've uh, psychoanalyzed them to little or no extent. And in all these 4,000 years, you, you and I got to remember, there's only been two periods when there were any sober alcoholics around. And of course, you and I are sitting in a meeting of one of those times tonight. And the other one was started about the same time Alcoholics Anonymous started only a hundred years before. I know we've read about it, something called the Washingtonians. And six guys got together in a bar in Baltimore. I was thinking about that when I flew into Baltimore. And they had a lot of trouble with drinking. And there, the biggest period of drinking in American history was in the first half of the last century. And everybody was drinking all the time, a lot of people. So these six people got together and they banded together to see if they could help each other stop drinking. And nothing like that had ever been done before. And they got some other recruits. And pretty soon they had a little cadre of people. And pretty soon they had a little meeting in Washington of people like them. And pretty soon they had a people, some people in Philadelphia meeting like this. And they called themselves the Washingtonians after Washingtonian, after Washington, the first president. And they, they just took off like wildfire. At the end of two years, at the end of two years, they were in most of the states, they expanded 20 times faster than AA ever did. In fact, the second birthday of AA, or the second birthday of the Washingtonians, which they, was on, they held on February 12th, 1842, they had little meetings all over and had local speakers come in and talk. And the speaker in Springfield, Illinois, was a young lawyer named Abraham Lincoln who came in to talk to the Washingtonians. 
I have on my wall in my office his talk, the text of his talk. It wasn't very long, but he really was quite knowledgeable. He was not an alcoholic, but he said to the effect of, I believe, as far as I can tell, the only difference between you and me is I do not get the, I do not have the thirst for alcohol that you do. It apparently does something special for you it doesn't do for me, so I can't really understand it, but I hope that you will always keep the way you're going. And by 1845, it was everywhere. There, there are estimates of their membership. The bottom estimate was 500,000 sober alcoholics. And the top measure, estimate was a million. And they were everywhere, sober alcoholics. Nothing like that ever seen before. Well, you start to think AA, after five years, didn't have a thousand members. And here they had a half a million. And then they did something that uh, seems quite normal, normal in AA today to many people. Did to me once. God, if we can help all these alcoholics, we should really help other people too. We should be of service to other people. We shouldn't deny them. And they begin to take in all kinds of troubled people, people who had narcotics problems, not alcoholic problems, just narcotic problems, not heroin and cocaine like today, but laudanum and opium. They took in people who were active in the anti-slavery movement. They took in people who were active prohibitionists. None of these people were alcoholics, but they all had a desire to change the world. And they just all got together, and they just were wonderful. And by 1848, the Washingtonian movement was extinct. And all of the half a million drunks were on the street, and I assume most of them died drunk. I have a book home written in 1862 by one of the few survivors, and he can't, he talked about all the wonderful work they had done, all the successes they had, and he could not figure out why they had dissolved. He said, it just seems that people stopped People weren't interested anymore. People got cross with each other. In, their in fact, it was these experiences of the Washingtonians in the early 1940s when Bill Wilson was having trouble and AA was starting to come apart. And a guy in North Carolina wrote him a letter and said, you know, Bill, we're getting like the Washingtonians. And Bill Wilson had never heard of the Washingtonians. That's how extinct they had become. And he got some books out and read about it. And he realized what a dreadful trap our organization was falling into with all its problems and struggles and conflicts with each other. And that's what brought him about to write the Twelve Traditions. The Twelve Traditions were based in a large extent on the Washingtonian experience, plus the AA experience that they was having in those days. You know, these traditions that we read so often today, it's just, we read them in the groups, they're just a... Uh, just an exercise to see if newcomers can pronounce anonymity <laughs> or autonomous. But they really, in my home group, we read the long form once a month because that's the way they were written. And they, they make it three-dimensional. What do we have to deal with here? And that's why, the reason all this I'm saying in all this is so that some of you new people might realize why they have the traditions. Because Hundreds of thousands of people died doing it the other way. We cannot depend on what seems right to me.